Hi again, everybody. So we're going to jump right back into the lecture, and we're going to start with the stomach, and we might get into the, the lower GI tract, so the small intestines as well, but um, I might just stop at the end of the stomach and the information there. It'll just depend on how long this lecture is. I don't want to make it too long. So the stomach is a J-shaped sac that sits in the, uh, mainly I will say, in the left um, hypochondriac region. And it is right below the diaphragm, which is why hiatal hernias can actually occur, which I talked about a little bit ago in the last lecture, I should say. Um, the stomach is a region where a lot of mechanical digestion occurs and some chemical digestion also occurs. Um, proteins and fats digestion can start in the stomach because we have enzymes that break fats and proteins down. Uh, materials are going to sit in the stomach anywhere, depending on the type of material, for um, just a couple of hours up to they can stay there for six or even sometimes longer than that, six or more hours. And um, then the material is going to be released through the pyloric sphincter into the small intestines. There are four parts to the stomach. The cardia is the topmost part, and I'm going to go to the next slide so you can see this instead of seeing the words. So here we have the stomach, that J-shaped structure, so you can see that J now. Here's the cardia. The cardia is where food from the esophagus enters. So you have this um, lower esophageal sphincter right here. Food enters into the cardia. The fundus is this large um, dome over the cardia. And then we have the body. This is the main region of the stomach where the majority of your uh, mechanical, chemical digestion occurs. And at the end, we have this pylorus. Right here, this is a smooth muscle sphincter called the pyloric sphincter that allows food to move from the stomach into the small intestines. The sphincter controls the amount of materials that enters the small intestines. The stomach has three layers of smooth muscle versus the two layers that are found everywhere else um, to increase the uh, mechanical movement of the stomach. And so uh, these get, and they have these gastric folds which are tiny folds within the stomach lining that increase the surface area so that when we have a large meal, say, again, I always use Thanksgiving just because, um, and we put a lot of food in our stomach, that stomach can stretch. Uh, the stomach also produces a lot of chemicals. So it has simple columnar epithelium that have goblet cells in them to produce a lot of mucus. Um, the simple columnar epithelium actually is found in the lining of the tissue of the stomach. And these, this lining actually forms these little indentions called gastric pits. And within the gastric pits, we have lots of different cell types. So we're going to go through those cell types. Um, and I'm going to just quickly show you those cell types, and I'll come back to this. So here you can see the gastric pits. And you can see all the different types of cells here that we're going to talk about um, within the gastric pits. So each of these different colors of cells, which our cells aren't really colorful, are going to have different functions. I did mention already that there's three layers of smooth muscle. We have um, an inner oblique, a middle circular, and then an outer longitudinal muscle. And these allow for the stomach to churn much more effectively, move materials forward and back, and um, really mix that food up with the gastric juice to allow for mechanical and chemical breakdown until we have a liquid soup-like substance called chyme. And then the outermost layer is your visceral peritoneum, known as the serosa. 
And so you can see those three layers of muscle here, the serosa out here, and then you see that inner columnar epithelium. So I'm going to go through these cells and um, I'm going to show you the picture of the cells instead of having you read all of this stuff, okay? Okay, maybe, there we go. All right, so here we have these surface mucus cells. These mucus cells are what produce your alkaline um, mucus. I don't know why I couldn't think of that, because they're called mucus cells. Um, the alkaline material helps to protect the lining of the stomach from the acid that is produced. And then we have these mucus next cells that produce a very acidic mucus that helps to increase the, the acidity of the stomach because we need an acidic environment for our enzymes that are produced to work. We have parietal cells. Parietal cells secrete um, intrinsic factor and hydrochloric acid. Intrinsic factor is necessary for uh, production of vitamin B. while hydrochloric acid is necessary for the um, breakdown of proteins. We have chief cells. Chief cells are what produce pepsinogens and gastric lipase. These are the two enzymes that function in this acidic environment and help break down proteins and um, fat. Pepsinogens work only in the presence of that acidic environment. In fact, it's the acidic environment that helps to make pepsinogen um, be converted into the active form, which is pepsin. And then we have G cells. G cells are your endocrine cells of the stomach, and they produce a hormone called gastrin. Gastrin then um, is secreted into the blood, and it helps with stomach motility. And so here you're seeing um, the um, chief cells and the parietal cells producing your pepsinogens and hydrochloric acid. Pepsinogen is an inactive protein, but when hydrochloric acid in, um, inter or intermingles with the pepsinogen, it cleaves a portion of that protein off, and then the protein becomes the active pepsin that breaks down proteins. So gastric, or the, the stomach functions, it is really unique. So as we um, think about food, our stomach will actually start producing gastric juice, which contains all that material that I was just talking about. Um, as food enters the stomach, even more gastric juice is going to um, enter the stomach lining or in, into the stomach. And the stomach's going to start churning. So you can see that churning over here. This is going to occur, and depending on the amount of food that enters the stomach, this is going to last for, you know, a few hours. And then, and the type of food as well. And then the stomach will slowly release small bits of the liquid chyme into the small intestine. Once food enters the small intestines, then another hormone, cholecystokinin, is going to be released that's going to inhibit um, stomach activity, so slow it down, and we're going to get the feeling of satiation, so we're no longer hungry. Um, and so this can be, this can occur anywhere from just a few minutes, like 30 minutes after eating to um, potentially an hour, depending on the type of food you eat. Uh, <clears throat> and when it occurs, that's when you're going to get that signal that you're no longer hungry. So this is one of the reasons why we tend to tell people to eat slowly when you're on a diet. The slower you eat, the less food you have to take in before your stomach feels full. If you scarf down a double quarter pounder with cheese and fries and a large chocolate shake in 15 minutes, you're going to be able to eat all of that before 
your stomach feels full. But if you eat slowly, you might only get half of that sandwich, a few of the fries, and maybe some of the shake before you're like, whoa, I'm full. This is where that saying, the eyes are bigger than the stomach. So there's a lot of different um, activities going on for stomach digestion. Um, <clears throat> we have pacemaker cells that are continuously activating, causing the stomach to move, which helps with uh, muscular tr contraction within the stomach. And this doesn't always occur. This is occurring when we get a signal that says, hey, you know, we're hungry, we smell something, we, um, our stomach has been empty for a while, whatever it is. The um, contraction itself the, the strength of the contraction is going to be associated with the nervous system as well as with different secretions that are being released. And there are three phases to um, stomach digestion or stomach activity. The cephalic phase is when we start thinking about being hungry, thinking about food, smelling food. Um, this actually causes your, your mouth to start watering um, it's going to send signals to your stomach to make it start churning, which is that stomach growling thing. And so this is before we even eat. Once we take that first bite of food, that bolus reaches the stomach, this is going to activate um, even more stomach churning. We're going to produce more saliva where our, our, our gastric glands are going to start releasing all of those chemicals. Actually, they've started before in the cephalic phase. They were starting to release chemicals, but they release even more now to increase the acidity of the stomach. And then your um, G cells secrete their enzyme or their hormones to activate the stomach function so that it works even more effectively. Um, <clears throat> once the food enters the intestines, though, this is going to inhibit stomach reactions. So it sends signals to the brain telling us, hey, you're no longer hungry. It also sends signals to the stomach telling the stomach to slow down. Um, the medulla is going to... Um, respond by um, stimulating your stomach to slow down as well. And cholecystokinin and secretin are the ones that are doing their job. They're the ones that are sending the signals to cause all of this reaction. This slows down stomach emptying, and when you're thinking about that, think about why would that be important? Why do we want to slow down stomach emptying? Why is it important to have small um, s small um, spurts of chyme entering the small intestines versus having all the stomach just empty at one time. I'm not going to watch this video. It's not going to play anyways. But if you're interested, you can just look up McGraw-Hill stomach and you'll find this video. So a disorder associated with the stomach is a peptic ulcer. Peptic ulcers used to be thought of as um, sores in your stomach caused by stress, and we now know that that's not really true. Peptic ulcers are caused by um, bacteria, Helicobacter pylori, and these bacteria actually live in a lot of people's stomachs, but they don't tend to cause problems unless you're under stress. So maybe you're you're feeling ill, you have something else going on, um, so your immune system is lower, you're super stressed because of school, and you're letting that leak into your um, health, that can actually lead to the production of, of an ulcer. So stress may play a role, but it's Helicobacter pylori that actually um, causes the actual sore, it burrows into that stomach lining, allowing the hydrochloric acid to also burn a hole in that stomach. Um, yeah, 
So there's some questions that I tend to like to ask uh, since I'm on video and I can't actually ask these. I'm just going to show you the answers. Um, if you have any questions about any of these, uh, any of these, definitely ask. It's always a fun one because I always get interesting answers, but the answer is vitamin B. I'm going to stop here because I've talked for 15 minutes and I don't want to overwhelm anybody. And I'll start the next lecture on the lower GI tract. Bye.